What's up everyone? Welcome back to Hustle is for Life Motivation and I want to start by asking you a question today. We're in the second quarter of 2018 and at the start of every year we set usual resolutions, we set our goals for what we want to do. But a lot of the times we give up. We don't put in the effort required to follow through. And as we know, follow through is everything. And I talk about it a lot. So my question is, how have you followed through with your goals so far? And we need to follow through with what we had originally planned at the start of the year. And a lot of the times we lose the steam, we lose the motivation and motivation, just the excitement. Motivation does not last. What lasts are habits and discipline. So we need to dis discipline ourselves and create the habits, create the systems and routine, daily routines in our lives that allow us to constantly work on our goals. And hence the focus of this channel, hustle is for life. Hustle is not just a one-time thing. Hustle does not mean that you go and you do something for the short term, you hit your goal and then that's it. It's a constant thing and you need to constantly work on all areas of your life in order to create that lifestyle that you really, really want. To achieve your dreams, you need to work on all areas of your life, whether that's finance, relationships, your business, your uh, you know, spirituality, your health, everything. So if you haven't been following through, then this should be a time for you to check in with yourself and go ahead and take action. So whatever your goals you set yourself, now is the time to look back, go over those goals and follow through. And if you haven't following through, awesome. Make sure you carry on and don't give up. And with that, I'm going to introduce our guest today, Mr. Jim Carr, who is amazing. He has a PhD. He used to be a professor in his previous life, but now he actually does a lot of different things. He is, and I'm going to go through the list. Um, he is a consumer researcher and award-winning corporate marketing leader, uh, a consultant, a speaker, a coach, and he has served clients on three different con uh, continents, including associations, small businesses, high growth tech firms, North America's largest martial arts organization, and many members of the Fortune 500. With that, please help me welcome Mr. Jim Carr to the show. Jim, thanks for being here. Uh, what a pleasure to be with you tonight. <laughs> well, it's tonight for you as we record this is the afternoon for me here in the States. Well, yeah, that's true because I'm in the UK. So, you know, there, there's that time yeah. difference. Awesome. <laughs> so, Jim, um, absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, you and I actually, we, we have some mutual friends, Dory Clark and, and um, also Chip Massey, um, who I have interviewed both previously on the channel. So guys, I'll put the links below. Check out Dory and Chip's interviews. They were absolutely amazing. Um, I had a blast and I learned so much from both interviews. So I think they will add a lot of value to you guys as well. But we have our mutual friends. That's how we connected. But man, you have a fantastic story. We were just talking before and you shared with me briefly, you know, what you've been uh, up to previously and what you're doing now. So let's start there. Um, tell us how you got started on this journey and what are you working on these days? Well, it's, um, it's been a mix of things. Um, Talal, I, I, I was looking back at each point, I, I think it made sense at the time. I'm not sure if you look at it uh, here in, in hindsight, um, but I, I've made a journey from being a, a DJ on a wow. commercial radio station. That was my first real job. Uh, That's back a in cool high job. school That's a cool uh, in a uh, little town in Georgia. <laughs> it was a cool first job. And uh, so, so that was, that was terrific for um, a slightly withdrawn uh, young guy to be able to, to, to get out and, and speak and play country Western uh, music uh, in my hometown. Um, and I've gone through and made a, a progression and uh, with, with my education in terms of undergraduate work and then uh, an MBA from Duke University, the Fuqua School of Business there. Uh, and I have along the way been a uh, corporate banker. Um, I have been a small business owner. I went back into uh, the, the radio business and uh, with a business partner, had a couple of very, very small market uh, radio stations uh, that we ran for a while and sold that business. And then I thought, well, what now? At that point, I was in my late twenties, and I know you're a uh, you're a, a lecturer yourself. And I looked back and said, "Who has the coolest job?" And at that time, I remembered my professors back in school. I think 
they have the coolest job around. They can get to research what they want. They teach a few classes. They do some consulting. Um, I'd like to do that. So I went uh, back, went to the University of Florida to get a PhD. And, um, and my expertise really was around marketing and media and mass communication. And uh, so those communication skills applied to business. Uh, began a teaching career. Um, I was never quite as cool as the coolest professors that I had, but uh, it was an, an enjoyable, uh, enjoyable ride. I started taking on some consulting clients and doing some writing. Uh, but I had a client who um, had a couple of businesses and was adding a third. And he challenged me, offered me, he tempted me to go back into the private sector, to be a, a marketing leader. Um, it was a, a brand, a business that had been around for more than 130 years, but was languishing a bit. Um, it had not grown in a decade or more. And he said, I need somebody to come in and help us all from the way that we, we advertise and promote to our packaging, to what the, the way that we sell, our distribution network, all of those things that, that make it meaningful. And, um, and I just had that entrepreneurial bent. And um, I could not resist the temptation. Um, so I, I give my, my wonderful wife, Allison, a lot of credit. It was another one of those things that she probably looked at me and just rolled her eyes. What <laughs> in the world are you doing? Um, but I did that. As, as you mentioned, I was a corporate marketing leader. Um, we had a small uh, business in, in a big global industry of the bottled water industry. And um, we actually, my second year there, were uh, awarded in our industry of having the best marketing and public relations program in the world among wow. all the members of uh, what was called the International Bottled Water Association, which I think um, really speaks to um, for your, your viewers and listeners that you don't necessarily have to be the biggest player to be the best. In fact, in many ways, if you're starting out, you're small, you're trying to figure how to grow, you have some advantages built in against the established players. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that, that played itself out in the marketplace. Uh, for the last um, almost nine years, uh, I've been doing uh, consulting work, some on my own, and then some through, it's a business-to-business -business, uh, consultancy called DSG, um, and uh, it's also in my, my new hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas. So that gives me the opportunity to work with a lot of bigger enterprises. So essentially what I do there most of the time is I'm building playbooks. So I'm working with salespeople, subject matter experts. They're oftentimes selling very complex solutions and products. They know their, their stuff really well, mm -hmm. but they have difficulty sharing that in conversation. And, and so you, you know the power of conversation, and I, I've, uh, I've seen over time the most important decisions happen as a result of a good conversation. And so uh, I spend a lot of time with people who know their stuff, who have a lot of passion, who have their goals, and help make it simple. Give them simple ways to convey their message. Give them some simple habits, as you were talking about. How can they hit their growth numbers? How can they do what they want? Some simple things that they don't have to turn their lives upside down because they won't do it. None of us will. But if you can build some, some productive habits in and expand your network and expand your influence, those are lessons that uh, I found apply whether you're a, a solo entrepreneur or starting a business or you're the little guy, or if you're a, you have a team or a not-for-profit or a cause that you are passionate about, any place where the spoken word or a conversation, the way that you can convey your story matters. That's what I'm excited to do. So what I've found is that all of those disparate pieces that I've been involved with and been led to over the years somehow feed into that. And so we can unpack that a bit and, and some lessons and some takeaways and things that I've learned along the way. So it was not a master plan. It was not a grand strategy uh, 20 or 25 years ago, but it's led me to a nice place now. Awesome. Awesome. And, and for people in the audience, this is exactly why I like to start the interviews uh, with the guests sharing their story and their journey because you've 
there's so much that you learn from it, but also you can relate to it, like how you started on your journey, where you are now and where you want to go. And you can clearly see that in Jim's case, he started off being a DJ and then he went on and became a professor and then he worked in business. And now he is here right now, you know, helping people reframe their message and essentially grow their business. So there's a lot that we can learn, but also we can relate to as well. Uh, and I find them absolutely fascinating. So this was absolutely fantastic. I love the fact that you shared that with us. But there are a couple of things you talked about there that I thought were really powerful. First, you said that people who are starting off, young entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, they actually have some advantages over already established businesses. I want to go down that rabbit hole. Can you talk to us about what their advantages are okay. and how people can maybe exploit them? Because I, well, I'll, I'll start from, uh, sure, the, the case that I had with okay, that sure. uh, bottled water company, and, and then we can generalize a bit more. Mm. So we had a, um, a little, little company uh, based in Arkansas. We had this, this brand of bottled spring water. And, uh, and so we're competing in a, in a product category that at the time was nearly $20 billion, billion U.S. dollars uh, around the world. Wow. Uh, and the major players are are very familiar names. Nestle is the, was, and I think still is the biggest uh, single market share player in the bottle of water market. So they own a lot of familiar brand names and known around the world, uh, Perrier and uh, San Pellegrino and, and some other waters. Uh, the Coca-Cola company who has a, uh, a brand of their own water that uh, is Dasani. Pepsi is in that world. And so if you're trying to, we could look at that and we could decide we can't win. Um, they are going to have all the shelf space and all the grocery stores and convenience stores and, and be on all the menus and, and all the arenas everywhere around uh, that we would try to go. And they have almost unlimited budgets in terms of being able to promote uh, their brands. Hmm. But we found that if you have a very good sense of what does make you unique and you can stay close to your customer, understand what the customer's voice uh, really is, and, and have as personal a connection as possible uh, in, the, in the branded product world, then you're going to do just fine. And you can run circles around it. I was basically, I had some, some colleagues with me, but I was pretty much the marketing department uh, <laughs> for our company. So I would joke that sometimes we would... Um, we couldn't afford, even though I'm a market researcher by trade, we could not afford to do a lot of, of research. So I just ha had to get out in the field and talk to people. And we'd joke around. I'd, I'd go over to my, uh, my office and, uh, and, and consider and say, hmm, the committee needs to make a decision. Okay, here's what I think we'll do. <laughs> and, um, and as long as I was helping the business, um, then, then it was okay. So to translate that into um, the kinds of things that, that your, your viewers may see. Again, as someone who's small business, they're trying to grow, maybe they're an entrepreneur, still trying to find their footing a little bit. You are close to your customer or prospective customer in a way that the big guys cannot be. Big companies spend a lot of time trying to establish the voice of the customer. They do surveys. They do things to try to do that. But the nature of them being big and bureaucratic mm. and dispersed means they, they can't do it directly in the way that you can. And so if you're developing a product or a service, um, I say use that advantage. Not only can you make a decision faster, but you can talk directly. You can really listen to what people um, want, what frustrates them perhaps, what seems missing with what they're doing today. What do they like about what they're doing today? Um, and, and pick your spots really carefully. Uh, we'll go I, I go back a little bit. Uh, you were mentioning Dory Clark as a, as a really good example yeah. of this. And she, in the, the stories that she tells and in her own experience of growing her own business, um, she's really built it on going out and talking to people, um, asking them questions. And, and she's at a point now, like a lot of um, successful entrepreneurs, she doesn't kind of go and say, I'm going to come up with a new offering and then try to pitch it to the world. Mm -hmm. She says, no, I'm going to go to my community of people who know me well and ask them. And I was thinking maybe about doing so-and-so. Would you be interested? And sometimes they may say, hey, that's great. 
will sign up. Sometimes they'll say, no, not so much. So there's no need to spin your wheels and trying to make something uh, into a force fit. So I, I think that's really the advantage is the proximity to the customer, the ability to engage people in real time and to do that and to be able to act quickly when you see an opportunity in the way that the, the, big, the big ones can Beautiful. I love that. So the two main advantages that you mentioned there, Jim, one was the fact that you are very close to your customer if you're a small business and you can literally, you know, reach out, talk to them, find out what their needs are, what they're struggling with and base your whole product or go back and reframe your product or your offering according to what the customer needs. Again, you can do it quite quickly because you're a small business. And the second thing you said yeah. was making decisions quickly, which allows you to obviously react to the changes in the market quickly or react to the changes in the uh, taste of your customers or in, in the preferences of your customer very, very quickly. Uh, and I think those are both really big advantages to have. Um, and I just wanted to highlight to the people. And also the fact that you talk about taking care of the customer, putting the customer first. And... For those of people who are familiar with the story of Amazon, that's how they started. They started, you know, by just selling books, but their main focus was on customer, customer experience and customer service. And now they are like the retail giant that they are today. It's absolutely insane. Um, so yeah, that's the power of, you know, working with your customer. And then the great story that you shared of Dory, which is also absolutely perfect because she focused on what the audience needs, what her audience needs. And she just works on that rather than actually create something and then like, you know, pitch it to everybody else and say, hey, mm -hmm. buy this because I created it or because it's awesome, whatever. So yeah, awesome. Absolutely great. I absolutely agree with all that. Um, now there's another thing that you talked about there, which I, again, am very, very curious to find out, very keen to learn about, and that's the habits. So what are those habits? What are your daily practices that you actually talk to your customers uh, about how they can essentially use those practices or leverage those habits to, you know, um, create a better marketing message or to really communicate to the customer what it is that they're offering? Uh, great question. And I, I look at those habits, uh, the way they play out for those who tend to be most effective in a couple of ways. So one is, what you might do individually. So if you're an individual entrepreneur or salesperson or, or, or leading a team or working in a team, those, those individual daily habits that you can have. And I, I think in particular with my area, which is about being able to communicate your value proposition well, to tell good stories, uh, to be able to listen to the customer and then reflect that back in their language. So as an individual, some of the best habits are to be in touch with your customers. Um, <laughs> you, it's interesting, um, and I'll tell you a, a quick story to highlight the point, and it was interesting how you mentioned Amazon. So Amazon is a behemoth, and they have grown um, daily on, on the power of information. And so I suspect that almost anyone uh, watching this has at some point bought something from Amazon. Uh, it's probably the case, but uh, so you'll relate to it. If not, well, what happens when you buy from Amazon, if you buy product X, then when you get that, Amazon and their magic analytics will say, hey, guess what? Uh, tell all the other customers who bought X also bought Y and Z and something else. Aren't you interested in those? Mm. And so they try to stay ahead of your preferences by uh, knowing kind of what, what other people do in that sort of situation. Well, I was giving a, a talk a few months ago to, um, there's a group of people and their business is in home and office delivery of products. So, so they're going in and they're taking snacks and beverages and office items and, and those sorts of things to people's doors. Right. And, and I talked to them about, they, they were struggling a little bit about how do they sell more to their current customers. And what I reminded them is about the Amazon experience and how um, that you have something that most entrepreneurs or most marketers would, would, they would bite off a finger if they could get invited into their customers' homes and offices every single day. Oh, yeah. And I said, so, so you have an opportunity and the, and the people who interact with customers, you get to walk in and see how they use your product, what they don't have. You can actually make personal recommendations, not based out of uh, machine learning 
or Amazon's analytics, but you have a person uh, who can hear their stories as well as sharing their own. And so individually, I'd say being able to, to reach out to customers directly, try not to automate too much, um, have that personal touch. And then when it comes to a team uh, of being able to share those stories um, across teams, lots of times people, maybe the businesses are in different locations or they're in different business units within, you know, sales is separated from marketing, is separated from product, who's separated from customer service, who's separated from everything else. They don't talk to one another. Mm. They don't share um, a sense of the unique value of the company. Oftentimes, it's very common, they don't all know all the things the company sells or who their best customers are or share some of the best stories. So the habit can be is if you have a team uh, or an organization is to make sure there are habits of where you can share that information, share the customer stories, and do that on a regular basis as your teams meet. And so the important knowledge isn't your products, features, and functions. The important knowledge isn't whether everyone's on quota or not. The important knowledge is how your customers are doing and how we can serve them better and what are some good, compelling stories that we can, we can use to, to help grow our business. Brilliant. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right there as well. It's um, so important to uh, have that essential personal touch and not just essentially automate the whole thing. So I love the fact that you talked about it, that don't just try and automate everything because like at the moment, the focus is on automate everything and free yourself up and don't worry about, you know, doing the work and you can have the free time to yourself. But then obviously by doing a lot of automation, you lose the personal touch with your customer. You do want to maintain the personal touch and that is it's essentially a big advantage that you have, um, which we talked about yeah. earlier. So yeah, perfect. I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, okay, so I, I have a question, which is kind of like a two-part question, I guess, but you talked about those two advantages. So part A of my question really is, can you still maintain those advantages if you grow in size? Because obviously when you're small, you can do that, right? You can make decisions quickly and you can you know, stay in touch with the customers. But can you still maintain those two as you grow? And secondly, how do you maintain them? If, if you can maintain them, how do you actually do that? How do you actually maintain those two advantages as you grow bigger and bigger in size? Uh, and those things are related. Um, the simple answer is yes, but you have to be intentional about it. Mm. So what happens, I find, is in bigger organizations. And so a lot of the work that I do now is, as you mentioned, with Fortune 500 companies or companies that are growing really quickly, they've had funding, they're, they're having success, um, but they need, to, they need to get into better habits to be able to sustain that growth. And I think of this from, a, again, a standpoint of, of messaging about uh, customer intelligence, they're uh, finding the right opportunities, success with marketing and sales, and, and, uh, and their customer satisfaction. And so, what, um, again, what, what tends to happen and this is very much just human nature. I'm certainly guilty of it. And when I don't follow my own advice, uh, Talala, I, I get into trouble. <laughs> so we, we all have, um, we, we kind of get comfortable. Uh, we get comfortable in the stories that we tell. We get comfortable in the customers that we talk to. Um, so comfortable that, that we don't want to talk to prospects or mm. people who might tell us no. Um, we get comfortable in our habits and, and, and that sort of thing. It's, again, it's just human nature. We always talk about being ready for change. Few of us ever like to actually change, right? Yeah. Unless we have to. And yeah. so what, what happens is when, when the organizations get bigger and they get to be successful, yeah. what I find is they get comfortable right? So people kind of know their stuff. They know the way that they sell or the way that they market or the language that they use. Some people who are very technically oriented in the product and the offering itself, they're in love with a product. And so that's what they talk about because they're comfortable in that. They may not understand the customer's world nearly as well, but they understand the product world. And, and that's where they're the expert. That's what they feel um, really credible and where they feel really powerful. Um, and, and again, whether it's their region, their business unit, their product, 
or just the way that they've been doing things after a while, that's our natural tendency. It's kind of a, um, a downward gravity, if you will. And, and so those who can continue to be successful and can continue to grow and innovate and, and, and continue to solve new problems mm. for customers or those who are intentional and they're aware of like, you know, we've been saying the same thing for five years. Now, maybe that's okay, but, but let's challenge that a little bit. Or the, uh, the people in one office uh, versus another office or another business unit, um, what are you doing today that's working and what's not working? So they have to kind of break out of the things that we typically do. Oh, yeah, we always get together for the annual meeting or the quarterly review or the whatever, and we go through the same motions. Those who can ramp up their effort or rejuvenate themselves as you say, have to be intentional about it. But um, I've, I've had more than one occasion of where companies who are in more mature industries mm. um, who have been successful and they're good, they're good at what they're doing, but by changing a few habits, um, they have been able to increase market share. They've been able to increase revenue, double digits in a reasonably short period of time. But it's about, uh, as you say, being aware of it and challenging whether what has worked until now or what's worked the last few years is really going to help us against some upstart new competitor that's, uh, that's going to be nipping at our heels in the future. Yeah, yeah. An absolute goal there, Jim. But I, I absolutely believe that you know, being intentional, uh, being focused, and consciously taking action towards your goals is very important, not just in terms of business and marketing and, and getting your message out and getting in touch with the customer, but also in all the other areas of your life as well. And you talked about also the fact that we get comfortable. That's a human natural tendency just to get comfortable. And that's what, you know, I was talking about at the start as well in the intro that we set goals. We you know, have these new resolutions in our life, you know, both in, in our business life, in our personal lives as well. But we then get comfortable and, you know, we, it's too difficult to make that change because we have our daily routines and we're just stuck in those daily routines. And this just takes too much effort to break out of those daily routines, leave the things aside and really focus on what's most important in order to move the needle. Um, so yeah, what you shared there was absolutely perfect and just tied in really nicely <laughs> from what we were talking about before. Um, I'm wondering. And I'll, I'll interject sorry. one more okay, point. Sure, and I on. think that the kind of work that you're doing, podcasts, TED Talks, uh, videos, things like that, um, the people that I've found to be um, creative and successful and growing uh, and intentional about it over a period of time, actively engage it that way too. So you're talking about personal habits. Um, I think, you know, we, we see, I see people who seem to really have it going on and they're growing, but they are also like, yeah, have you checked out this new podcast? There's a book. I'm going to read something outside of my domain. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, hear something that whether it's spiritual or emotional or knowledge based or whatever, it's going to get me a little bit out of, out of my zone, what I've done. Maybe I've, I've only read fiction. Maybe I'll read some nonfiction or vice versa. So, uh, and what I like um, is uh, say even just with, with uh, your show and the episodes, you have people coming at these life issues uh, from a lot of different directions. And so there is some diversity built into that. So I just encourage uh, people who are getting value from these kinds of conversations, keep doing it. Because you, you'll never know. I, I've heard it expressed very well. Um, I can't remember who said it. But um, uh, innovation is, is actually taking something that works in one domain and applying it in a new domain. Mm. So it's not starting from scratch. It's not pure invention. Yeah. It's, it's trying something in a different spot and seeing how that works. So I think that's the, the kind of contribution that, that you're able to make through the show as well. Oh, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, that, that actually is really powerful what you shared there uh, with innovation. Um, and you're absolutely right, because if you think about it, you're not going to be able to reinvent the wheel, but you can find new uses for it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So fire, the wheel, gravity, the big stuff's been done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're not going to you know, reinvent that stuff, but you're going to find new uses for it, right, in different domains. So, yeah. No, exactly. I, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. And, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was really powerful. I, I really like it. Awesome. Um, 
you you talked about the fact you know there that um, when it comes to when it comes to actually making those changes, you have to be intentional. You have to be conscious, and I think that's really important because you can show up, right? Like you can you can go somewhere, you can go to your job, you can you know come up come to your home, your relations, whatever. You can show up. But showing up doesn't guarantee success. What guarantees success is being intentional and taking focused, deliberate action towards it. Right? That's very true. I agree with that completely. And it might be that if you're in, you know, intentionally taking a close look at what works, what feels fulfilling, how you're continuing to grow as a person, and in areas that may be frustrating for you or, or you may be getting a little bored or whatever that might be, the result doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to change dramatically. Mm. You know, you might find upon review that you're really in a, in a good spot that you're doing some things. So maybe the changes and the growth are just, are, are, are incremental. They're really small, but at least you'll know why you're not, uh, you're not standing pat just because you're afraid of changing. It's because you're making an evaluation at each point uh, in line with your goals and what you feel your purpose is. Mm. And, and then taking stock at each point along the way. So um, this need not be scary. And I've had to remind myself of this time and time again. Um, there's nothing scary about the, the examination of all this, right? Um, and so uh, you, you might come to it and say, I want to make a major change. And, and at least you'll know why that is too. But I, I approach it very much from a standpoint of not scarcity, of feeling trapped and helpless and, and, and the like that the world is small, but from a sense of abundance, mm. there are a lot of options and opportunities that are there. And again, sometimes finding if you've landed in places that you feel like I'm in a good spot, maybe there's some things I want to tweak and do a little bit better and serve other people or more people in a little bit different way. Uh, and that's okay too. That, that will give you great comfort and fulfillment in what you're doing now is it just because well it's what i did yesterday <laughs> and so uh and i'll show up to use your language and see if anything changes today so that examination on a periodic basis i find to be very very healthy how about you mm, yeah no i totally agree absolutely and you know when when you are taking action or inspired action um towards something it's so different to then just showing up Right. Showing up doesn't mean that you're taking inspired action. You're, you know, excited about it and you're trying to, like you said, you know, going out of your comfort zone and exploring other domains and trying to see a good fit for, you know, other models. And, and can you act, how can you bring them in and integrate them? Um, so, yeah, it, it is so important that you continue to do that because that's where growth is. That's where success lies. Right. That's like one of the metas of success, essentially. Exactly. And, and listen, not every day is, uh, you know, divine lights come in and, um, you know, the, the bluebirds sing and the rainbows come out and, and, <laughs> and that's sort of, sometimes, sometimes work is work, right? Sometimes your hustle involves kind of putting your head down. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I got word. I, I, uh, I have a, a book contract. I'm going to have a, a book that'll, that'll come out uh, in 2019. Awesome. That means I have to finish writing the book. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, there'll be days showing up and go, I really don't feel like writing <laughs> today. And, and you, you know, you push through it anyway. So there, there are times it's going to feel like work because it, work will be involved. But mm. to your point, if you if feel like you're, it's for the right reasons, you know, you're going to the right place and you're continuing to grow as a person, then you can get excited about what the result will be. And I think that makes a big difference about what it's like when you show up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's what also important is, you know, because this show is all about exploring the, the mechanics behind creating long term, sustainable, holistic success, because I believe our goal shouldn't be just to like, you know, get to a certain level in our career or business or you know what your bank account looks like or having a certain car or, you know, having a certain relationship like it has to be a, a holistic su success goal, right? Like you want to achieve success in all areas of your life. So what that means is that really you have to show up and, you know, take inspired, focused, conscious, intentional action in all different domains of your life, right? That's where the hustle is. Hustle is for life. Essentially, it's for all areas of your life. And it's not just a short term thing. 
Uh, agreed. And I, I love the approach. And then, and one thing that I, um, and of course, I, I see this a lot through the lens of messaging about how people share their value and, and how it helps them get to where they, that they want to go. Um, and one thing that I've found, and I certainly believed for, for many, many years uh, until all that extroverts are the most effective, most persuasive, most influential people. They're the ones who are going to do the best as an, as an entrepreneur. They'll get out there. They have thick skin. They don't care if 99 people tell them no because the 100th person will say yes and, and they'll, they'll grind it away. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people might sell themselves short because they say, I'm not that person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an extrovert. I might consider more an introvert or I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. And I saw some research a few years ago from a different domain, but I, uh, I thought it was, it, it really changed my mind. As someone who has studied communication and marketing and sales for years, but it was a study um, by uh, uh, a guy named Adam Grant, who is a successful author. He's a Wharton School professor. And he studied salespeople. Um, at a company uh, on the West Coast of the U.S. But what he, he did is he tested this assumption that extroverts were the most persuasive and that they're the best people at selling their ideas and selling their stuff. So he had salespeople, and, and there was a way he could actually measure their effectiveness and how much time they spent at it and whether they just cut the price, you know, to make a sale and that sort of thing. Um, and, and whether they were introverts or extroverts or somewhere in the middle. And he found two important things that I think um, all, of your, all of your viewers could keep in mind in terms right. of their effectiveness and being able to share their value. The first thing that was really surprising was that uh, if you looked at the, the two ends of the scale, so the, the extroverts and the introverts were statistically the same. The, the extroverts were no better at selling than were the introverts, wow. which was a big surprise. Yeah. The second part about this, though, was in the middle of people who are near, you know, not in the extremes. So they, they measured this on a one to seven scale. So the, the fours, the people right in the middle, were the most effective, hmm. more than the pure introverts or the pure extroverts. Um, and, and when you think about that, it starts to make some sense in hindsight that pure introverts are maybe not as proactive. They, they're, they're very good at kind of absorbing context and understanding things, but they might not be as forthright. They might not be as, as proactive or aggressive in, in going to prospects. On the other hand, the extroverts don't shut up. <laughs> they talk all the time. Yeah. Uh, they're often talking about themselves and, um, and, and, you know, for all of their strengths and, and their, their motivation and their willingness to, to grind it out, they're sometimes not listening very well. They're not mm -hmm. kind of taking in what the customer's saying or what those true needs might be. And so um, whether you find yourself on more of the intro or the extra part of the scale, you know, there, there, there are things that you can do. But here's the, the, the huge point, and I think it should be very empowering for everyone. By far, most people are in the middle, naturally. We're not on the extreme introvert or the extreme extrovert. We're, we're somewhere in the middle. When we have a conversation, you know, it tends to be give and take. It tends to be kind of 50-50, you know, a good conversation would be. Uh, people talk about themselves. They listen to others. So most of us are naturally wired to do this. Whether you're, again, an entrepreneur, whether you're working within an organization, whether you have a cause that you care about, um, whatever that might be. Chances are your natural wiring, your natural personality is just fine for it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think that's something as, as people look to that, um, whatever, whatever your hustle might be, whatever you're trying to do and value in your family, in your community, uh, in your business, whatever that may be, uh, you're, you're probably suited for this just fine. Beautiful. I love it. I absolutely love it. Awesome. Um, well, Jit, this has been a phenomenal conversation. You just added so much value. We explored so many different things. We went down so many different rabbit holes. Um, but some really important lessons came out as well. Some really, you know, like pure gold came out of this, okay? Like golden nuggets that people can take away. Um, 
you talked about the fact that small businesses have two main advantages. One is the fact that you are close to the customer and you can make decisions quickly. Um, you talked about uh, the fact that there is has there has to be focused, intentional, um, you know, sort of action that you're taking to make sure that you're not getting stuck in a rut. You are getting out of your comfort zone and yeah. you are reaching out to your customers, you're relating to them, you're finding out what they need. We looked at like almost two case studies, I guess, Dory, uh, who's a mutual friend of ours, and also Amazon. Um, and then we went down other rabbit holes and we looked at, you know, how do you essentially create success? What are the methods of success? And we, we looked at holistic success in the end. Um, and it was just, Absolutely amazing. I love this conversation. <laughs> this was phenomenal. Um, and and, and to, to everyone watching, we had no idea we would be comparing Dory Clark and Amazon. We didn't yeah. plan that at all. No, no, we don't. <laughs> this was like off, off the cuff. Like we did not structure this interview uh, at all. Uh, but yeah, this was absolute blast. Uh, absolute pleasure to have you on. We'd love to have you back. But where can people go to learn more about you and how can they help you right now? Excellent. Well, I would, I would love to come back, and I, I hope this has been very valuable. Um, the best place to, uh, for people to find out more about me and to get some, some things that they can use um, in their own lives and in their own businesses is my website, jimcarr.com. I have, my spelling of car is K-A-R-R-H, uh, and I'm sure to be in the, in the show notes. It's, uh, yeah. it's a lot of consonants, but uh, uh, jimcarr.com. If you go to the site, I do a free weekly newsletter. It's really short about a two minute read called the message manager memo. Um, and in that I'll, I'll just pass along some tips. And so, um, people who have read that I've been doing that now for two years and, um, uh, is a little, little inside knowledge here. My open rates are twice the industry average people get, I always get feedback on these. I try to make them something very, very practical. And, uh, and very easy, simple for people, uh, again, whether you're uh, an entrepreneur, whether you're working in a larger enterprise, whether you have something else that you care about and you want to be able to get the message out. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you find it useful. So uh, but very much my pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure to have you on. Um, and for people in the audience, I encourage you to go ahead and uh, just reach out to Jim. Uh, how awesome would it be if we reach out to Jim and Jim just thanked him and just say thank you so much for being here um, and uh, taking the time to come here and add value to us because I learned a lot of different things and explored a lot of different things and I'm sure there was a lot of value that you guys out of it as well. Uh, and I will also say go ahead and share these conversations, share this interview that we, we're on right now with people close to you, with people who you think need to hear these messages because it will help them grow. It will change their life for the better. There's a lot of negative stuff out there, especially in the news, but not a lot of this positive stuff that actually helps you to expand your mind and grow. So please share these messages and make sure you subscribe to the channel because at the end of the day, that's how you're going to stay up to date with all the other awesome conversations we're going to have with more amazing guests. And finally, me and Jim, we'd love to hear from you. We want to know what is it that you're working on right now and what are your main goals for 2018? What are you struggling with? And most importantly, how we can help you restructure your message so you can share it with your audience, with the people around you in your life, with your family, with your co-workers, your neighbors, whoever it is, to let them know what are your dreams, what are your goals, and who do you want to be at the end of the day? The biggest question we have to ask ourselves, who do we want to be, what impact we want to leave behind, and what kind of dent do we want to make in the universe? So we'd love to hear from you guys. Leave the comments below. All the links will be below in the description, so go and check them out. Jim. Let's make it round two sometime soon. I look forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, guys, stay awesome, hustle hard, and make sure you take focused, inspired, conscious action towards your goal in 2018. And I'll catch you in the next one.